These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Do you want to believe? Amen. Y'all going to have to help me a little bit this morning. Amen. You're going to have to receive the word this morning. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus, standing upon his recorded works alone, is validated as Lord and Savior. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us the life of Jesus, and there are a couple of isolated incidents in the, the epistles which relate things to us of the life of Jesus. But these two verses summarize the purpose and the intent of the gospel of John. The gospel of John was the last gospel to be written. It was written some 70, roughly 70 years. We, we have two books here, the youth and the, and the not so youth. The book of John is the last of the books of the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the last one that was written. And John is the only disciple who died a natural death. And he lived uh, 40, 50, 60 years longer than any of the other disciples. And, and we actually have a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a physical, tangible connection between the Apostle John and even modern scholars today with Polycarp and Irenaeus and, and then so forth that begin to go up. Polycarp being John's student and then Irenaeus as being a student of Polycarp and, and then we have some of their actual works written from around 100, 120 A.D. Josephus among others. But these two verses summarize the purpose and intent of the Gospel of John. That you might read what the Bible says. That you might read what the Scripture says. And that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through His name. To fully comprehend the extent of his work and the impact of his work, not only upon the world in which he lived physically, but throughout the hundreds of years since. It's not a privilege to be taken lightly, nor to be trivialized by a carnal world. Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus was not just a good preacher. Jesus was not just a good prophet. But he was God, manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh, come to be the sacrifice. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. i got to get excited when I find out there's a hope I have of not perishing, but being saved through the work of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the book of John, in chapter 1, is often referred to as a prologue to the book of John, but it is a powerful glimpse into the nature and the power of God. I encourage you today, if you've never read John chapter number 1, it's about 54 verses, I think, something like that, maybe 51 verses, 51 verses. We're given a clear look into the glory at the beginning of the pre-incarnate Christ. Clearly the purpose is to allow us to comprehend the magnitude of His love for us. He's the creator. He is the conductor. He is the architect of the entire world. And the book of Hebrews so powerfully declares it, attributing it to Jesus Christ when He says He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the planner. He is the builder, the root and the offspring of Jesse. And He is the living Word of God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The power and beauty, the power and beauty of Him condescending into an arena in which according to the flesh He was destined to lose. From a fleshly perspective, Jesus Christ lost the battle. But He would come forth spiritually triumphant for us and us alone, seeing as He was in the beginning the Creator. And all things were created by Him and for Him, and there does not anything exist that was not made by Him. Amen. Try it, dice it, slice it, explain it away. I saw a deal the other day. I saw a deal the other day that, that they have a... They have a, anybody ever heard of Isaac Asimov? 
Anybody ever heard of Isaac Asimov? I saw one hand. He's a science fiction writer that wrote uh, many prolific uh, uh, science fiction books. And, and they have a, 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 a group of scientists and, 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 and uh, uh, really, really, really smart people get together and they have a convention in honor of him. And, and there was one, and, I, and for, for goodness sakes, I see his face, but his mind escapes me right now. But he said, I will not be surprised if we do not get to the end and find out that this entire universe was being simulated by a power that's higher than we are. Amen. Well, I, I, when I first started reading it, I was mad at him because I didn't understand what he was saying. As you can imagine, he's up there way ahead of me somewhere. But then I realized that even scientists and, and people that are learned are realizing, oh God, help me right now, that all of this stuff that we experience and that we see and, and the beauty of the world and, and us even existing, that there's somebody that's in charge that's making it all happen and that the world plays his sweet music as he lifts his baton and waves his arms conducting this world according to his will. The victory of Calvary's cross and the escape from Joseph's tomb was not for him, but for us. He had nothing to prove. He had nothing to prove to anybody. It wasn't about proving he was greater than the enemy. It wasn't about proving he could live forever. It was about enduring what he endured and suffering what he suffered, dying the death he died, but that he might rise again, that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly. He forever reigns and remains the I Am. Revelation 1, 4 through 8 says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall will because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and and the ending saith the Lord which is, which is, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. These are written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life through His name. See clearly the will of God. Seeing clearly the will of God, and we cannot rationalize how that the will of man submitted to the will of God results in elevation. The laws of man thinking says that I must constantly rise up, that I need to make more money, I need a bigger house, I need to drive a nicer car, I need to spend a lot of money at the doctor to make myself more pretty. That's the world. To be better to present myself better to have more that's the law of the world is I've got to constantly be climbing up but the law of God says i got to go down i got to go down that as I humble myself before Him in order to become more like Him it's which when I am exalted or made better I want to let you know that everything in your life will be better once you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost it does not mean everything changes it does not mean you don't have to pay your bills no more. It does not mean you won't get sick no more. But it means that you will no longer look at things through the same eyes and that you will wake up every morning of your life with hope swelling up inside of your chest because your Redeemer is still on the throne. Let me tell you something, it ain't no secret, it ain't no mystery. When we come in here and pray for 12 hours on Saturday, you can rest assured on Sunday, Jesus is going to show up in a mighty way. 
because he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal from heaven. I will heal their land. I will forgive their sin. Prayer changes things. Prayer works. Whatever you're going to receive from the Lord today is going to be because you begin to communicate with Him. You begin to open yourself up to Him and say, Here I am, Lord. I submit to you as the King and Creator and Lord of my life. John chapter number 1. In 51 verses contains as much powerful doctrine as possibly any chapter in the Bible. From the declaration of creation to the clearly delineated revelation of the incarnation, somewhat of a review of Pentecost and the work of the Holy Ghost in somebody's life. There's also an introduction of sorts of John the Baptist and of course the declaration of God in Christ from the bosom of God. No man has seen God at any time, the Bible says. But the Son of God hath declared Him. He's declared Him. We have an introduction of Jesus by John the Baptist. It's a powerful, powerful introduction when he says, I'm not the Christ, but I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, make you way the paths, straight the paths for the Lamb of God. First there was Andrew. And quite possibly John himself, a disciple who has remained anonymous. And then there's Andrew's brother he's introduced to. He's a man you might have heard of named Simon Peter. And then Philip was introduced to Jesus Christ. And then Philip goes and shares with a man named Nathaniel. And he says the Messiah has been found. He of whom Moses and the law did speak, and the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, among others, no doubt. Nathaniel's response was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now there's much speculation as to why Nathaniel might have responded this way. Nazareth wasn't among the prophecies of the Messiah and, and it was a small village of little consequence and once again I, I'm happy to say I was able to see Nazareth while I was there and went through Nazareth and we had a little meeting in Nazareth and, and it's still yet not a city of any great consequence and we see from Jesus' visit to the synagogue there that they were a people whose skepticism was manifested by their lack of faith and a refusal to believe even after Jesus healed a few, the Bible says, but he could do there no mighty work. You did read that in the Bible, I hope. He could do there no great work because of their unbelief. Except he just healed a few. I want to ask you a question this morning. Brother McKinney, how many do you reckon he would have had to heal before they would have believed? Or Brother Robbie, was it just their natural propensity to not believe? I, I can't help but read this, that, that we live in such a world that, 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 uh, uh, that today they'll believe one thing and tomorrow they'll believe something else with just as much passion. Today, today they'll be in love with somebody and tomorrow they'll be in love with somebody else with just as much fervor and just as much passion. And, and to, you know, today's likes will be tomorrow's dislikes. They were a people that, that refused to believe. Even Jesus Christ, who came in in the Nazareth and healed. Jesus Christ, who went to the synagogue in Nazareth and stood up and read the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 61. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it to the minister, and then proclaimed "Is the, this day is this word fulfilled in your ears 
and yet he went away. I got to let you know something today before I move any further. I am. I really don't want to disappoint the Lord Jesus Christ not one more day. He is going to come into this place as he already has invaded this place and he has invaded it for you. Do not let Nazareth be reenacted today as Jesus Christ walked away from Nazareth. We can might say he's done a few things. I felt the power of the Lord. There's been a few people respond. There's been a few people inspired. But I want to let you know he's got a whole lot more that he wants to do today that he hasn't been given the opportunity to. Do not go out to eat and leave the Lord here with tears pouring down his face because of an unfulfilled promise in your life. Obviously, Nathaniel's question is rhetorical. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Sister Sharon, it would appear that that would be a common response from anybody. It's just like uh, there are places around here that, that, uh, that folks might say, can anybody good ever come from there? It's like Nazareth would be. But Philip is very quick to answer. He doesn't think about it. Maybe before this day, he might have even felt the same way. Nathaniel was of Cana of Galilee, where no doubt uh, it had been uh, uh, widely talked about that Jesus' first miracle took place at Cana. The water turned into wine. But because of, oh God have mercy, because of where Jesus was from, Nathaniel was automatically prejudiced against him. But Philip is very quick. Excuse me, very quick to answer. He doesn't think twice about answering. When he answers a three definition answer, come and see. Denoting both his faith and feeling toward Jesus. Philip has received him and believed him as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the anointed one, as the deliverer. But now he has no qualms about inviting Nathaniel to come see him. Because he is assured that Nathaniel will also be convinced and that there's no fear in Philip that Jesus would fail to represent himself and represent himself well. Amen. Take me to 47 if you would. Uh, boy, I had a lot of things. I, I'm, I'm going to get to the good part. My whole message is going to be like five minutes. But as I was reading this, I just things began to come out to me. And the Bible said, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. A statement filled with such powerful undertones, not just to Nathaniel, but unto us. We, 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 we sometimes feel like that, that we worship the Lord as if He doesn't want to see us, and, and that we worship the Lord because everybody else is. And, and then when we get into His presence, He's kind of surprised and said, Who let you in here? But the truth of the matter is, anybody that begins to call upon the name of Jesus, uh, that begins to open up their Bible, that begins to get up on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening or Sunday night, uh, and begin to come to the Lord, the Lord, Anybody that stands in front of their mirror while they're brushing their teeth and declaring, Lord, I wish I had some of you. He sees you. He sees you coming toward Him. Coming to Him. We're not talking, oh God, I want to preach this morning. We're not talking about a, a meaningless meander go out like, you're, like you're window shopping or, or you know when you go to Walmart to pick up a thing of batteries and they got the batteries right by the checkout aisle. But somehow or the other, you've got to hang a right right inside the door and make you a great old big circle around the whole store so you'll end up at the battery aisle and you done picked up 500 things you didn't need. That's not what it's like when you begin to come to Jesus. He's not going to just pick you up as a meaningful meander. Brian Bartimaeus was a beggar every day except when Jesus came by. And when Jesus came by, he didn't holler for money. He didn't holler for alms. He didn't holler for nobody to help him. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I want to let you know that if you're in the house of the Lord this morning, you are coming toward Jesus. And he sees you. He's got his eyes on you. He has ordained your life and bring you to the kingdom for such a time as this. Jesus saw him coming to him. That's how it begins. Notice Jesus' address of Nathaniel and his description of him. He said, Behold, an Israelite indeed. Embodied in Nathaniel is the recognition of the heritage of the Lord. You cannot be an Israelite 
and be disconnected from God. Now maybe in your mind, and maybe in your likes and your dislikes and your habits. No, I don't think you heard me. It is impossible to be an Israelite and be disconnected from God. Because, Brother Chris, there are 12 tribes of Israelites, uh, and they all come from Jacob, their father, who came from Isaac, who came from Abraham. And it is in that same bloodline that of the, of the seed of David, uh, in the tribe of Judah, there was born a baby in Bethlehem of Judea, and his name shall be called Jesus, uh, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, in him, is the, in Nathaniel, is a recognition of the heritage of the Lord, uh, chosen of God, ordained of God, created created by God and he has embraced the knowledge that as an Israelite that an Israelite is nothing but a child of God a child of promise now regardless of what they do with it regardless of how serious they take it the Israelites are who they are <laughs> oh. in whom is no guile now, just, just kind of like a little hint. Here lately I've been praying. And when I pray, sometime throughout my, my prayer time, I say, Lord, I don't want there to be any guile in me. Guile. It's a word not often used in today's vernacular, but it's a powerful testimony of the character of Nathaniel. Now I want to ask you something. Just because I'm not going to holler here for a few minutes. Just because I'm not going to spit and I'm not going to yell and I'm probably not going to sweat as much. I want you to stay with me because I really feel in the Lord to slow down and let you hear what I'm about to say. In whom there is no guile. Guile is defined as skillful deceit. But it is not just the deception of others, though that does include it. But it describes no self-deception, nor any disposition, any desire to deceive others. Notice that he is not described as sinless, but guileless. Now I had a hard time, I'm still having a little bit of a hard time putting together Jesus Christ, but when we get to the end of the sermon, I think you're going you're gonna to grasp it. Sister Lee and Jesus described him. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. But our introduction to Nathaniel is Philip said, come see. Philip said first, he said we found him. Of whom Moses and the prophets have spoken of. We found him. Right? Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Which would automatically speak to prejudice, would automatically speak to a, a preconceived notion or a preconceived idea. But I want you, God help me, Jesus, help me, Lord help me. If I invited you to go to, let me think of somewhere that, that I don't know anybody that lives there. If I invited you to go to Pile Town this afternoon and eat dinner with me, how many of you even know where Pile Town is? There's two or three, four. How many is going to go with me to eat dinner over there? Probably nobody. You know why? There ain't no place to eat over Pile Town. I don't even know if it, How about Frisco? Huh? I ain't talking about the one in California. I'm talking about the one over there between Bluff and here by Dexter. If I told you tonight that we had a that we had a powerful evangelist coming from Pennerman, you would automatically think Pastor Dunn lost his mind. All those are real places. You would automatically be skewed. Well, I got to show up and see this. I got, I got to show up and see this. People's preconceived ideas and, and preconceived notions make us have a mindset. But however, it is important to note that Nathaniel followed Philip to Jesus. 
He doesn't describe Nathaniel as sinless but guileless. No, no, no intent of deception. What you see is what you get. That is, he isn't hiding behind any facade. He isn't sheltering himself or even protecting himself, especially according to his prejudices. You see, our prejudices are protection. Perfect example. Peter's preaching to the Gentiles. They throw out a big spread, and Peter sits right down with the Gentiles and eats. You remember that? Until the Jews showed up. You know what Peter did? He got his plate and skedaddled. He didn't want no Jewish folks seeing him eating with Gentiles. Right? Isn't that in the book? Think about... I, I, don't, I don't want to embarrass her, but I... I uh, we, we've talked about it much, and she's been very open and about, you know, Sister Pam has, has been worshiping with us for a few months now since, since her mama came to be at the church. And I remember the first time she came down to the altar, and the Holy Ghost moved on her. And, and before you know it, she's talking in tongues. And then all she can say when she got done is, I thought this was fake. I thought this wasn't real. I made fun of y'all when I was a little girl. I said, there ain't nothing to it, but it's real. But think about think about how many people that all they know about Pentecost is holy rollers. Crazy. I still got a friend. It ain't never happened. But he vows and declares he came to church here and some woman did did somersaults down the middle aisle. That ain't never happened. But people have such a, a preconceived idea of what it means to be Pentecost. I've even heard it said, my children can go to church anywhere they want, but they ain't going to Pentecost. They're crazy. Even in some lines of thinking, to be Pentecostal is a byword. One of my uncles even, in a, in a, a slip of some sort, was in a, in a little, you know how at a family reunion people would cut up and laugh with one another and he... I'm standing right there and him and this other fellas they're going at one another kind of little insult and he said you're acting like a Pentecostal preacher and then I said I am a Pentecostal preacher it's not much different than what Nathaniel thought about Nazareth it's not much different than what Nathaniel said. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? Phillips. <laughs> oh God, I wish I could preach a little right now. Philip said, come see. Come see. Nathaniel, in whom there is no pretense immediately. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? But there's no guile, there's no pretense, no intent to deceive. And undoubtedly, he also relishes that attribute in others. Because when there's no guile in you, when there's, when there's no pretense in you, when there's no facade in you, you want to be around folks that are real too. Jesus saw him said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel says the, the proper response that many of us would ask. How do you know me? I talked to an evangelist this week. A buddy of mine. We're getting ready to hang up. He said, let me tell you about my story. I was in prayer the other morning. I hadn't talked to my aunt since back around Christmas. But I was in prayer the other morning and the Lord impressed on me to call her. And the Lord impressed me there was an issue going on with her. And the Lord told me what the problem was. And so I called her. I said, hey, how you doing? She said, I'm doing fine. Are you feeling okay? Yep, feel great. And then he said, what about your stomach? And she went stone silent. She said, what do you know about my stomach? So he proceeded to tell her what was going on with her stomach. She said, how do you know what's going on with my stomach? 
He said, the Holy Ghost told me. And then she started. Because she's been borderline whether she believes in God or not. And now she knows she ain't told nobody about this. But the word of the Lord... God, help me Jesus right now. Ha! 